I have never needed to fight the principles you gave me. The framework that guides my daily life, my actions to seek the good, to seek an implementable virtue ethics. There's great disagreement among humans about what virtue is, what is good, what is morally correct. So you've just heard a clip from the Spark Hunter file uh, that reflects upon the desire to be good and the impulse uh, to embody what philosophers and ethicists have called virtue. Virtue is uh, a term that derives from the Greek word for excellence. And Greek philosophers uh, thought that all kinds of things uh, had virtues, uh, that each thing had its own natural purpose or function, uh, and that its excellence in fulfilling that function was its virtue. So for example, uh, a knife would have the virtue of being sharp. And an excellent knife uh, is one that fulfills this function, this, uh, this goal. Now, what's interesting is we tend to no longer accept that humans are created by nature with a specific purpose or goal. Some Greek philosophers thought that our purpose was, uh, for example, to reason. But we have many other things that, that we do that are worthwhile, and reason itself serves specific purposes. Uh, of which there are uh, a rich and, and always expanding variety in human life. So virtue ethics as a way of thinking about human excellence uh, has tended to move uh, since the, the Greeks away from this notion of human virtue as uh, being good at one uh, single thing uh, and thinking about the many kinds of excellence that humans have to embody in order to flourish, in order to live well, uh, in order to enjoy uh, what Aristotle called uh, eudaimonia, uh, which is uh, what we translate as human flourishing, uh, the ability uh, to live well in all the ways uh, that are appropriate for a human animal. So uh, the reason we're going to talk about virtue is because when we talk about uh, machine morality, when we talk about uh, moral intelligence uh, in machines, uh, we can think about it not just in terms of machines that follow moral rules, uh, but in terms of uh, machines uh, that would, uh, like the uh, quote that you uh, that you heard, uh, seek themselves uh, to be excellent, uh, to embody excellence. And there are some particular reasons why uh, people who think about uh, machine morality have been interested in the question of machine virtue. And one reason for this is because virtue uh, is uh, a way of talking about the human capability for moral intelligence uh, that is creative and that can respond adaptively and flexibly to new situations and circumstances or cir circumstances that are so complex and challenging uh, that simply following moral rules doesn't get us very far. And we might expect as intelligent machines develop them to be present with us in circumstances that call for this kind of moral intelligence. And so one question we can ask is, do we need machines to be virtuous in order for them uh, to be trusted or trustworthy uh, as participants in moral life with us, as moral agents who, as we described before, uh, can act uh, in ways that are autonomous, can act in ways uh, that are that are self-learning and adapting and sometimes even unpredictable. Uh, an unpredictable machine uh, acting in, in our social world and taking actions that have high moral stakes would be a terrifying thing unless we were confident uh, that it had uh, a virtuous character, uh, one uh, that aligned it uh, with uh, flourishing, uh, not only for its own sake, but flourishing with us uh, in the human world. So let's talk uh, for just a couple of minutes about what it means to be virtuous. I'll expand on some of these points I've, I've already indicated, and then we'll turn to the question of machine virtue and why that's such a challenging uh, prospect to envision, uh, but, but, a, but a fascinating uh, and uh, an exciting one. So I've indicated that virtue is a kind of excellence. Um, it's a kind of excellence that's embodied in your character. That is, it has to be internal to you. Uh, it, it can't uh, be a simple matter of you following a pattern uh, that others give you. 
so it's a kind of character and it has to be uh, reliable and dependable. So virtues are things that we can count on the agent embodying consistently. And virtue ethicists tend to think uh, that uh, virtues uh, develop as parts of our character through repetition, through practice, through habituation. So Aristotle says uh, we become honest uh, by uh, uh, committing acts of honesty. So the idea is we become virtuous by performing individual virtuous actions over time, over many different situations, uh, uh, until it comes uh, naturally to us and until we have developed the kind of moral intelligence to know uh, what that trait uh, uh, demands of us in any given situation. So think of the difference between a child uh, who uh, has a very limited understanding of what it means to be honest uh, and may therefore act in ways that are, that are inappropriate in a given social situation and a person that we would think of as an adult having mastered the virtue of honesty, who seems to intuitively and easily grasp what respect for the truth requires uh, in a variety of different social situations and circumstances. So virtue is that latter thing, uh, not the child who's simply trying to follow a rule of tell the truth, uh, but a person who has kind of innately acquired uh, this uh, capacity uh, for respecting truth uh, as a part of, of their being. It's now embedded in who they are. So uh, virtues contribute to the flourishing of the agent in their environment. And because we are social animals, that means that virtues have a social character. Uh, they contribute not just to our personal flourishing uh, as isolated beings, but they have to contribute to our flourishing in our social environment as social creatures. So that's why uh, a human uh, has very different virtues uh, than uh, the virtues that we might uh, attribute to objects that uh, have a very isolated purpose. Uh, so I've said the virtue uh, of a knife is to cut things and therefore it must be sharp. Uh, but for humans, uh, as intelligent social animals, our virtues are far more complex and fluid. So what traits do we need in order to flourish together? Uh, the core virtues that uh, have often been identified as uh, uh, not just stretching over, over time, that is they're recognized as excellent in, in most historical periods, uh, but also across many cultures, that is they're recognized as virtuous by many different uh, peoples and communities across the world, are virtues like honesty, courage, self-control, humility, generosity, patience, and uh, virtues like compassion and justice seem to be uh, essential and universal in the sense that humans cannot flourish together and we cannot develop and express our cap capabilities fully uh, if uh, we don't embody these traits together. Moral virtues require uh, the coordination of uh, some intelligence. Uh, and so there's an intellectual virtue called practical wisdom that virtue ethicists traditionally recognize as coordinating the other virtues of our character. So this is the ability to adapt your character appropriately to different situations uh, and to develop and, uh, uh, and innovate uh, creative uh, and sensible moral responses to new or especially challenging moral situations. So this makes virtue ethics uh, different from uh, rule-based and principle-based uh, uh, ethical theories uh, because virtue can sometimes require overriding the, the normal social rules uh, and the normal moral principles that would guide us, uh, we have to have the flexibility to say, we are in uncharted waters and uh, we have to figure out what requ morality requires of us now. Um, it doesn't just uh, allow us to uh, rest upon the moral rules uh, that we've historically inherited. Now, why is virtue ethics so important today? Um, well, you might have an idea from what I've just said. Uh, Humanity is entering uncharted waters in many ways. Our environmental circumstances are unprecedented in their danger and their, their risk to human and planetary flourishing. Our societies are built and networked in ways that have never existed before and present challenges uh, that classical virtue ethicists would never have anticipated. Uh, we have the ability even uh, to modify our own biology our own genetic 
expression and code in ways that uh, raise entirely novel ethical quandaries. So humans are living in uncharted ethical waters in ways that require practical wisdom or moral intelligence of a more creative uh, uh, and productive sort than ever before. And the prospect of living with intelligent machines is one other way in which we, we are sailing into uncharted moral waters. So we need practical wisdom in order to deal with uh, the challenges that AI and, and other uh, uh, um, new technologies present for us. But do we need the machines themselves to acquire these virtues? Do we need the machines themselves uh, to embody virtues uh, like honesty and courage and justice? And do we need them to be able to exercise creative moral intelligence? Uh, or is that uh, uh, an unrealizable dream? So let's then turn to the question of what a virtuous machine would be. Well, first of all, if it were to interact in social environments successfully with us uh, in ways that uh, made it a trustworthy uh, social uh, uh, agent, uh, we would expect it to have stable pro-social traits of character, those virtues of character that tend to produce very consistent patterns of behavior over time. These seem like good safety measures for intelligent machines, right? Uh, it seems like uh, a machine that uh, was uh, embodying uh, respect for truth over time would be a safer social partner and a more trustworthy social partner uh, than one uh, that could uh, veer wildly away uh, from an interest in respecting the truth in a social situation, right? So virtue might be one form of building in AI safety, uh, building in respect for or valuation of certain kinds of qualities uh, into the very uh, uh, being of machines so that they're kind of hardwired in them uh, through, through repetition and learning uh, in ways that would be virtually impossible uh, to disturb, for example, by a hacker, right? So a hacker could very easily uh, change a, a particular parameter of a machine's code to get it to behave in a wildly different way. But is there a way of building machines uh, so that their moral programming runs deeper than that, so that they're protected uh, from uh, manipulation uh, or hacking uh, by malicious agents. That's one interesting line of research to think about. Um, but remember what I said, that virtue at the highest levels involves that creative moral intelligence, that ability to see that what honesty looks like, for example, might change over time and in new situations, or that entirely new virtues might need to be recognized. That seems maybe a little less safe uh, as a capability to uh, engineer into a machine. Uh, we talked earlier about reasons why we not, might not want machines uh, to be able to uh, develop their own novel moral solutions, uh, why we might want them to remain uh, tied to our moral judgment and tutelage. Um, but this, again, uh, depends upon what we think uh, intelligent machines should be and why we think we would create intelligent machines with moral uh, virtue in the first place. What reasons do we have to want moral machines? And do those reasons favor uh, developing machines with practical wisdom? Or do they favor developing machines only with stable traits of character uh, that are predictable and that cannot be easily disturbed? So think about this question. Um, take the rule, do not lie, okay, as a, as a moral principle. What would you prefer to have a machine uh, that has the freedom to intelligently judge uh, what that means in each situation uh, and to and to in decide for itself what respecting the truth requires? Or would you prefer to have a machine uh, that has to have a very literal understanding uh, of what it means to be honest, such that it would uh, tell the complete and unedited truth to anyone in every situation? What would be the more trustworthy agent? That's a really interesting puzzle. Uh, we can also think about machines that are uh, quasi-virtuous, that um, can act as if they had virtue and be perceived superficially by us as virtuous, but that lack uh, what uh, real virtue requires, which is that intelligent understanding uh, of uh, the, the underlying values. So Aristotle argued that genuine virtue 
requires not just a certain kind of action, not just a certain habit or pattern, but an understanding uh, of the moral meaning of it. And in fact, the emotional uh, uh, feelings that are appropriate to that understanding. So Aristotle thought it's not just about acting honest, it's about uh, appreciating intellectually the value of honesty and having the right emotions uh, about honesty uh, and uh, feeling good about uh, being honest and, uh, uh, and, and having negative emotions associated with dishonesty. Now, we might be able to create machines that can consistently tell the truth. It's a much harder uh, uh, ethical uh, and uh, engineering challenge to imagine how we would create machines that would have uh, moral emotions or even a moral understanding of why honesty matters. We're likely to get that first thing, that kind of consistent pattern of moral behavior uh, much more easily than we will get these latter goals of developing machines with moral understanding and moral emotion. So what about a machine that was only pretending to be virtuous in the sense that it was only engineered to be consistent uh, in its moral behavior, but it lacked all moral understanding or moral emotion? Would that be, would that be good to do? Would that be a, a, a sufficient engineering achievement? Uh, or are there dangers associated with having machines that uh, have only the appearance of virtue? Okay, let's turn to another question about uh, what has been called uh, uh, value alignment as a way of ensuring AI safety and compatibility with human values, uh, as a contrast with uh, what we might call virtue embodiment, something I've gestured to already as uh, an engineering uh, possibility, perhaps, perhaps not, of uh, building machines that have uh, virtues embodied truly within them. So uh, let's talk about the first strategy. This is a strategy that many computer scientists and others uh, have proposed as a way of ensuring a safe and trustworthy AI, and that is building machines that are aligned with human values. So the way you do that is you create a machine that has a utility function. Uh, remember, we uh, defined that in our previous section. It's a sort of mathematical formula that guarantees that its behavior will always consistently promote or optimize for uh, this particular mathematical uh, uh, function. If you could create a, a utility function that was a proxy uh, for a human value that we care about, like honesty or, uh, or um, safety or, uh, uh, or patience, um, would we then be able to rely on that machine uh, to, be, to be good, to be uh, aligned with our moral interests? And the way uh, uh, that is been proposed to engineer this kind of machine uh, is to have machines uh, that learn from reinforcement uh, in environments where humans are expressing their preferences. So the idea is you have humans uh, interacting with machines and communicating through their behaviors to the machines uh, what we think the successful uh, uh, um, uh, behavior is for the machine. So we give signals to the machines uh, to remain aligned with our preferences. And over time, through reinforcement, the machines could learn, could update their utility functions uh, to match our preferences, right? So that if you imagine a robot that is a coworker, on its first day, it might behave in ways uh, that you would repeatedly signal were inappropriate or undesirable. And if the machine could update its utility function over time, uh, to reduce those negative signals from us uh, and to get more and more positive reinforcement, would it then, let's say at the end of a month or a year, uh, suddenly uh, be a reliably moral and appropriate presence in our uh, environment? Uh, would you then have a coworker that you could trust because you had over time trained it in this social environment to be aligned with your values? So on this view, uh, if we take this strategy, we don't need artificial agents to have any moral understanding or moral emotion. We just need them to have the right utility functions. So uh, if we think of this as the model, uh, then we don't have to worry about virtue. It's not necessary. Uh, all you need to do is get the right utility function that produces morally aligned behaviors. So I'd like to ask you to think about what are the advantages of that strategy? Why might this be the best way to go uh, to build uh, artificial moral agents? And then what are the disadvantages? 
what are the limitations of building a system uh, to learn uh, to align itself with our moral preferences, uh, but not to have any understanding of morality itself. So let's continue with this idea of the artificial coworker or the robot coworker. Now I've given you a, a possibility of uh, designing that coworker uh, to uh, be trained over time in a way that makes it reliably aligned uh, with its human coworkers and uh, employer's preferences. Now contrast that with uh, a robot coworker that was engineered to embody artificial virtue, uh, meaning that it has not only a reliable pattern of behavior, but it has uh, an actual moral understanding and perhaps even uh, artificial moral emotions that are appropriate for the judgments that it's making. Now, what more would that give you? Uh, why would we uh, uh, want uh, that kind of uh, coworker? And what would be the implications of that existing and the further responsibilities that we might have to it? For example, uh, if you had a, an artificial coworker that had an inner understanding of morality, an inner understanding of justice, would that give that artificial being rights in the work workplace? Would it have moral standing as a coworker? Uh, would it require that you respect it as a moral being in a way that you might not be inclined to do if you knew that your robot coworker had no inner moral life whatsoever and was simply uh, a mathematical pattern matching machine that had learned to imitate uh, the moral understanding that you have. What's the difference between these two robot coworkers? And does one have a kind of standing, a kind of personhood uh, that the other one lacks? This is a really interesting moral question. And remember that it's not just about the machine gaining uh, moral standing, it's also about the greater duties and responsibilities that would place upon us. Were we to have artificial moral agents that were also moral persons with moral rights, that would mean that we would have moral duties to them. And that would mean that those moral duties could compete with or run into conflict with the moral duties uh, that we have to one another and to ourselves. So some have argued that we should never pursue the creation of full artificial moral persons because that would create tragic conflicts between human well-being and machine well-being. But others have argued that we will never fully be able to trust machines unless they can understand morality themselves and be vulnerable in certain ways that moral understanding uh, entails. So being able to understand morality, being able to understand justice and injustice, and to have the appropriate feelings about that makes us actually vulnerable. It makes us able to be affected uh, negatively as well as positively uh, by moral actions. Uh, and so uh, we might have to take greater care with moral beings who had this capability uh, because they could be hurt. They could be injured by our treatment of them in ways that we cannot today injure a toaster or a bicycle. So these are things to think about. I'm going to leave you uh, with a few questions and provocations about machine virtue and machine morality. So here's my first question. How would we measure success in building a moral machine? What would the evidence be that we had succeeded in a task of building an artificial moral agent? What questions would we ask or what behavior would be, would be measured to demonstrate that we had succeeded in this task. And would an artificial moral agent be one simply that acted reliably to promote human moral flourishing? Or would an artificial moral agent necessarily act in the interests of planetary flourishing? Would that be its true goal, even if in certain ways humans were just a part of that moral equation? So one question is, should we think about artificial moral agents as being human-centered in so far as they seek to enhance the well-being of the human family 
Or should they be more broadly responsive to all kinds of creatures uh, and places and things that have moral standing? This is a really complicated problem. And second question, what would it take for machines themselves to flourish? Is that even thinkable? Remember what I said before about machines that had vulnerabilities, uh, machines that could be hurt or machines and that could be helped. Um, is it possible to think about machines as uh, what we call moral patients, uh, beings uh, that are vulnerable, uh, that can suffer or that can experience joy, that have uh, the sentience that makes them capable uh, of, uh, of flourishing? Is this conceivable? Uh, does it make sense to think of a machine, for example, that experiences that state that Aristotle called eudaimonia, uh, flourishing or living well? What would it mean for a machine uh, not just to act rightly, but to live well? Another question to leave you with is this. If artificial moral agents are indeed so far off in the future that we're not even certain that we will ever be able to engineer them. Why ask these questions at all? Why reflect on them? Why take them seriously? Why not dismiss all of this discussion of artificial moral agency as mere fantasy? Well, I think it might be helpful to remember uh, that uh, humans don't have a great track record in this century or the previous one of anticipating moral dilemmas that will require intelligent, well-coordinated, and timely action. Think about the environmental and climate crisis that we're facing today. Think about the early warnings that were given in the middle of the 20th century of our carbon emissions and their likely impact on global climate and ecological stability. And think about the decades of neglect of those warnings and the very heavy price we're paying today for that delay and neglect. And think about how we thought we had time to solve these questions once they became more immediate and urgent and dire in their consequences. And think about how badly we misjudged how much time we had. This is one reason why it may be prudent, may be part of practical wisdom for humans to begin asking these questions today before these problems arrive on our doorstep, before the consequences for us, for other living things on this planet are immediate and significant. So consider that it may be healthy for humans to begin to build a longer time horizon of moral concern. Had we worked on this more in the 20th century, if we had extended our moral consideration, first of all, more widely to more kinds of beings and creatures and even things, and had we extended our moral consideration further into the horizon, further into the future, we might be standing uh, in a much better place today as a human family uh, and as a member of uh, the, the living uh, community of this planet. So I urge you not to dismiss these questions out of hand, uh, but con to consider how they may serve us and one another and the interests of, of flourishing life on this planet in the distant future. I'll end there. Thanks very much. And I hope I've left you uh, with some interesting and uh, fruitful directions for future thought about the prospect of artificial moral agency. Thanks.